Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, I want to thank Charles and Sam so much for inviting us here tonight. And I'd also like to thank Josh, who did a really great uh, music quasi therapy session before us. I think we all feel very chill right now. So within this vast field of sonority, psychoacoustics seems to be on the side of listening. It takes as its starting point the assumption that sound is heard through a body and that within that body is a mind making sense of the sonic phenomenon. So today we're going to talk about embodied listening with recourse to some of the political and the personal implications. We are joined today by the phenomenal artist, A.K. Burns, who's here with us in body and mind uh, to discuss her work, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> and um, also, we're joined by the composer and artist, Jules Jimbrone, who is more like the ghost in the machine <laughs> this evening, or this afternoon, rather. Jules's work often involves um, absent bodies, disembodied sounds, acousmatic voices, and a very transhumanist treatment of instruments. And so it's very fitting that Jules will talk to us through a pre-recorded audio tracks made while the three of us were in correspondence. And I've been thinking about these audio tracks as arias. I use the word arias because they communicate, uh, articulate very concrete ideas through language, but also bring a meaning in excess of verbal signification. And I hope that this more experimental format will help reflect or perhaps even enact our exploration of queer sound, acoustic identities, and that very unstable link between sound and subjectivity. So I'll, I'll, I'll play the first aria and then our conversation will extend from it. I've been waiting. For a good moment to use this effects box. It's called Voice Box by Electro Harmonics. And it has a button on it called Gender Bender. And what this does is it bends your voice to become another gender because Of course, there is something about gender that can be heard in the voice, right, right. It makes me also think about how in audio, in audio, in audio, in audio, in audio, in audio. In audio. In audio. In audio. 
audio. In audio. In. In. In audio. In audio. We use a lot of gender terminologies. For example, there is a female to male adapter, and then there are things called male to male adapters, and then female to female adapters. And what this means is that you have a female adapter that has an input. So female is synonymous with input. And male is output or a insert or form that looks like a penis. And when I go into Radio Shack, for example, I have to use this kind of terminology when getting audio equipment. And it's very, very uncomfortable. And seemingly archaic. But that is where we are with audio equipment. Okay. How do we follow that up? <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty good, but I think we can follow it up. Um, so, Jules is reminding us that these kinds of gendered assumptions are built into the very language that we use to uh, talk about sound and equipment. But I guess the first question I had when I listened to this is, the if the Radio Shack example is, is kind of making us use this archaic language, this kind of uncomfortable language, then what are the politics of voice box with the gender bender application? I'm kind of curious about what this kind of technology says about our current historic moment and, our, and, and what we currently think about the relationship between our bodies and technologies. And you want me to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> um. This is more well, just something, yeah. Like a general, I mean, I mean, we're living in a state of, like, sort of avatar personality. Mm -hmm. So the whole, I think, I'm not sure what I have to say about it because I, I, <laughs> um, I mean, this is this is like decoding language, right? So there are things that are prescriptive to the way we communicate and to the way we uh, denote formal, metaphorical um, information. Mm -hmm. And um, you, you know, it's the idea that um, uh, sound equipment wouldn't participate Right. In that language, which is encoded in the way we do most things, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it would be fairly avant-garde for sound equipment to 
think that it would move <laughs> beyond that. <laughs> but I think it's interesting because I think we think of sound as one of these, uh, I was talking about this earlier with you about, um, it, it gets relegated to somewhat of a utopian sort of art mm -hmm. form in the sense that it tends to be seen as something that transcends like kinds of communication. Mm -hmm. You know, audio has this kind of even, especially even pop music, there's a kind of, you know, you could be anywhere in the world and hear Beyonce almost mm -hmm. at this point or, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and people share the love of bad pop music. Mm -hmm. And communities you form know. around them. <laughs> and, yeah. you, what can you, you know, you can't deny it. Right. Um, and, and that of course goes all the way down to like, um, noise music and um, I think s cinema plays a really big role in that in terms of um, uh, the kind of audio that we don't pay attention to in particular right. that happens in cinema because um, fully sound and uh, so much kind of what might get relegated in another category as sort of avant-garde sound uh -huh. is actually something that's like highly constructed within cinema in a more sort of pop cultural manifestation. Right. But and, you, could, and you could remove yeah. it and it would almost sound like an avant track, not, yeah. not in that context. So I think, I don't know, I mean, I, I, I I'm think not sure what I have to say yeah. about it specifically mm -hmm. other than, yes, it sits within the same kind of mm -hmm. ling linguistic confines yeah. and, and formal confines that we find ourselves in generally. And yeah. something strange <laughs> happens when we, when we point to it and when we're able to kind of see the way it's operating or, or listen to the way it's operating within our things. But yeah. you're, you're um, bringing cinema into the conversation, I think it's really interesting to think about, especially in, the, in, in relation to two of the works that you have on, on view tonight that I was hoping we could talk about, which is um, Untitled Shaving Piece and The Orchid Show. Okay. And I was thinking about these two pieces because in both of them, there are moments where you're bringing our attention to the imaging technology, right? There, if, if you guys haven't seen them yet, what happens is there's a kind of redoubling or a, like a mise en abiem where we see footage within footage in both of these pieces. And in the untitled shaving piece, the soundtrack seems consistent with the gesture that's being performed whether we are like in that kind of fictional space or whether we're kind of you know taken out of it for for a moment mm -hmm. um, with the orchid show you alternate between the ambient sound and a uh, musical score that was added post-production mm -hmm. okay well so both of those pieces i use that let's say technique of the mm -hmm. misson and you okay. said that so beautifully mm -hmm. <laughs> and i screwed up my fantastic french um <laughs> but the with the shaving um project that was a performance that my partner and i did um in which um she straight razored my body so um i grow a lot of hair from the waist down <laughs> and um we uh we were doing another project called the brown bear which was a um a salon salon, we were cutting hair and it was, a, we had a queer archive and we were dealing a lot with how aesthetics are built when you do or don't have visuals, cultural visuals. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it was kind of triggered by like recognizing that suddenly there's a pop cultural image for queers and there wasn't until very recently and like mm -hmm. what that does to a culture or a mm -hmm. subculture. Um, Anyways, uh, and so one of the things we had found in our research was um, a series of photographs um, taken in a dungeon in San Francisco of a shaving fetish. Um, and it, of course, was gay male. Um, mm -hmm. or, or, um, space. And we were thinking a lot about, like, why wouldn't that happen in a, you know, lesbian or queer woman centered mm -hmm. space, you know, and, and of course part of that is of course that women are expected to already shave, you know, there's sort of no counter culture to shaving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. growing your hair is actually the counter culture form. Um, so we wanted to see if we could kind of um, 
uh, embody and appropriate that mm -hmm. image. So the doubling of the image comes from the fact that it wasn't our original image mm -hmm. um, in that one. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also why, so the, what sound you hear is um, the sound of the actual shaving. So you'll hear mm -hmm. like the scraping of the hair and stuff, and which is lather. really like intense yeah. and like, yeah. uh, uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Um, which you want that, we wanted that viscerality to it. But then there's another layer where sometimes you'll just hear like clanking of stuff in the room because mm -hmm. there's parts of it that are videotaping of the videotaping mm -hmm. of the performance. And so you have the, then the doubling of the sound. So mm -hmm. the audio in that is really just to represent that kind of mm -hmm. uh, actual layering or the sort of actual duplication or the sort of lack of origin, mm -hmm. let's say, in that work. Mm -hmm. um, then the um, the Orchid show, um, I was m much more about dealing with a sort of contemporary like obsession with the spectacle and the camera, um, but interested in how that related to nature or what is natural. Yeah. Um, but of course, in the context of um, the Orchid show that occurs at the um, Botanical Gardens, which is a like highly staged event and not yeah. natural at all <laughs> and right. um and so um and i was also looking at that because i was interested maybe in the same way we can talk about the male to female adapters but of course mm -hmm. these kind of tropes of how flowers get um gendered which mm -hmm. makes no sense because they're intersexed mm -hmm. but they typically get placed on the feminine mm -hmm. spectrum in orchids in uh, and orchids and exotified mm -hmm. the orchid also jumps mm -hmm. into that realm and um and so and you know and there's a kind of zoo like quality to going to the orchid show too where it's like really the the flower on display and then you have all these cameras assault i mean it's like <laughs> it's like it's watching like a paparazzi. porn it's yeah. like really <laughs> intense you can't even see the flowers because there's so many cameras mm -hmm. like <laughs> up in the sta stamen, you know what I'm saying? It's just like, um, <laughs> and I was really overwhelmed by the inability to actually see the flower. Mm -hmm. um, and so that document came out of that. And then part of what I wanted, when I was soundtracking it, I, um, I started looking into um, women classical music, um, uh, sort of w women com composers mm -hmm. of classical music, because I also think of that genre as, it's heavily masculine. It has a long Absolutely. history of being sort of, it's actually hard to find, um, uh, you know, it's just not the mm -hmm. canon as it were. Um, and classical music also with flowers, you know, there was the kind of doubling of tropes that I was interested in, but I wanted mm -hmm. to know what that sound was um, produced by a different body. And this is where I get into my interest in who makes music, not just right. the sound of music. Um, and, uh, so I found this track by Ruth Crawford Seeger, who mm -hmm. happens to be Pete Seeger's mother. Um, okay. She was a classical composer, um, modernist classical composer, and um, yeah, and I kind of interlaid that in with that. Mm -hmm. And do you think that the having her composition there also um, plays with the idea of the, you know? We, we have the, f the nat nature is in this construct and nature and nature is also kind of announced as n nature through the image, right? Like all of the people are taking pictures of what nature looks like. And also this is a gendered kind of nature on, on top of it. Um, you've mentioned before that there is a relationship between sound and an uh, identity in terms of a kind of undoing of identity, uh, kind of taking it away from the myth of origin or the myth of biology or the myth of the, the kind of natural world. And so I was wondering how sound could kind of help undo that and, and whether the female composer. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I put it out there more as a question than, than mm -hmm. like a, does, Ruth Crawford Seeger's composition dramatically changed that work if mm -hmm. I hadn't picked a Mozart mm -hmm. or Beethoven or I don't, you know whatever something more obscure but um, 
it, you know, it was, I th often for me it's about um, visualizing something you don't, or audio. Mm -hmm. <laughs> things that are not heard, things are not, that are not seen, yeah. right? And um, so it's, it's a question maybe of visibility, and, and that's audio visibility too, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know that it, I, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. that it makes a difference. I, but I, I compose with that intention because, or with the ideas of sort of um, someone's being imbued in its making as having value, like mm -hmm. that what body you bring to something actually changes the way you make. Mm -hmm. I do sort of on some level believe that, mm -hmm. you know, and I, and I think we see this also, I mean, in terms of uh, going back to pop music, but you know, cultural appropriation is at, like all time high. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, it's like the idea of sounding black, right. right? You know, it's something people are attempting to achieve, you know, and there's a kind of goal in this mimicry, in this audio mimicry. Mm -hmm. um, and that then the, that also filters into picking up aesthetics, cultural aesthetics, and appropriating them. So, I sort of do believe that that um, I don't know that bodies carry a kind of materiality into the making of what mm -hmm. they produce. I, I don't know. It's a little woo woo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but, but it, I, I, I think it, it, it makes sense, and, and, and Jules kind of speaks to this point, too, you know, the idea that there, there aren't, there's no such thing as a neutral body, yeah. and to, to assume that it, it doesn't matter what body made it is to kind of assume that, there, that all art comes from a universal body in a, in a universal mind. And that one's experience isn't informing exactly. that. Exactly, and, sort of and then it ends up denying whole sets of experiences. Yeah. Um, let's, let's play the, yeah, the next aria, because I think, I think this is actually a good moment to do so. So, I'm gonna talk a little bit about queerness. So to me, queer is simultaneously an intensely private and highly contested political body. In popular culture, difference is often deciphered in the flash of an image, a word, a into two-dimensional presentation, which is then identified, categorized, sensationalized, scrutinized, objectified, and ultimately ghettoized by structures of power and privilege. Sound like queer, a reprioritization of the nuanced body, the flexible body, the imagined body, and the listening body. I find in a visually dominated world, we are conditioned to a flattening of information through quick optical differentiations. A more complex understanding of subjecthood can come from the auditory. And this is why 
I typically work with sound. I'm less interested in what a queer subject appears to be than what it does and what is done to it, what shapes it and what it shapes and more specifically where it asserts its autonomy and power in a world that is intent on its categorical silence. Thanks, Jules. Thank you for that, Jules. Um, but yeah, I think they're speaking uh, um, quite smartly about the the idea of the you know what what the queer body is is doing and um, is done to it and the um, power of this kind of complex subjectivity to reminds me of the way you've been talking about your new project on negative space. Um, and the, the, the reason I'll, so. Should I give a brief? Yes, please do. I don't please know if do. I can do a brief, but um, so <laughs> Sophie's referring to a project that has not yet been seen. <laughs> um, and it will be out um, at Participant in this fall. Um, and it's called Negative Space. And it's a, uh, let's say, a queer feminist speculative fiction multi-channel video epic thing. How's that? That sounds about right, yeah. And there's a lot more to it, but I'm not going to get into it because it's too tedious. <laughs> but what's interesting, what, what I, what I think is one of the, uh, a kind of through line through it is um, this idea of negative space. And it's very much a nod to these science fiction films, um, but it also has to do with contemporary environmentalism and then issues of de-territorialism as it relates to a fluid sub subjectivity. Um, and so in, in that respect, I think the idea of this negative space is quite similar to how Jules has been describing queer sound. Um, mm. Well, negative space is a term that I, I think about in, for me, is, is the queer body, right? So if positive, positive space, the typical, typically the way we orient ourselves is that we have positive space and negative space is everything that is shaped by the positive space. So it's negative space is amorphic, uh -huh. uh, has no form until it is given form by the other, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so it's sort of subject to the other, subordinated to the other. So, um, but it's also kind of open-ended in this way or kind of indeterminate, like always... It's always, yeah, it's always, a, it's always in the potential. process of becoming. Yeah. <clears throat> but then also what I sort of posit in it is that, that you don't, you obviously don't have po positive space without negative space and so that they can be inverted and not be subjugated mm -hmm. one to the other, but be so more this isn't the in female adapter <laughs> right. and male adapter. This is the kind of symbiosis of, mm -hmm. of parts that I'm interested in anyways. Mm -hmm. So, or an inversion of, mm -hmm. of thinking, yeah. And, and do you think that, that, that it, there's a sonic analogy for this? That yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I, um, I'm trying to think. I, um, I mean, queer is a funny thing. It gets really overused these days. So it's, it's a, <laughs> I do I really appreciate Jules's definition. Um, mm -hmm. I also sort of always define it as, I actually think everyone is born queer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think, and then we're socialized otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, and, I think that's why coming out of the closet is actually just a return, mm -hmm. <laughs> a return to self. And I also think that a lot of artists are quite queer because they spend a lot of time kind of undoing social right. norms or unthinking those things. And so I think it's something that everyone sort of is participating in and has different levels of access to. But I also, the, what, what Jules points out is the personal part of it, which is that some bodies are, uh, feel it in a really, day-to-day uh, -day way that's particular mm -hmm. and different than saying that everybody could universally be occupying the queer right. space. Right, and, so. and are treated different uh, in right. society and, and so forth. So um, in, in terms of sound, I mean, I think one thing that we kind of talked about offline um, was this whole notion of 
that I think about a lot, which is the sort of prior, and, and Jules brings up, which is the pri priority um, of the visual, mm -hmm. um, and, mm -hmm. or that as a primary sense mm -hmm. um, uh, in our orientation in the world. Um, and I think, I mean, one of the things about the way I think about because I do make visuals. Mm -hmm. I'm not like Jules. I haven't. Uh, <laughs> I'm actually deeply invested in making visuals. Um, but I think of I think of sound almost as deeply as I think about the visual. Mm -hmm. um, and I uh, and I and I th I think that often the the sound comes second or something mm -hmm. in audiovisual work. And and for me, they're kind of moving simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And I, I will be thinking about an audio thing before I will understand a visual or vice mm -hmm. versa. Um, and I don't know where that comes from for me because I don't see myself as a musician particularly or anything like that. I mean, I used to DJ a lot and uh -huh. I consider myself a, a listener, mm -hmm. like a deep listener, <laughs> a, a collector mm -hmm. of sorts. And um, in this most recent project, because I'm kind of recognizing my obsession with audio, um, I'm actually giving myself the space at a residency right now to do um, audio um, collaborations and solo work where I'm actually just dedicating myself to making sound mm -hmm. for the video and I'm making the video here and I'm making the sound here and then they're going to be composed in the editing room. So I'm also not like Very sound tracking process. the visuals. I'm mm -hmm. actually having an audio experiment that kind of runs simultaneously music. with the visual Improv because I work very improvisationally with making visuals as well, so it's allowing me to do kind of both. So I don't know what I'm going to get. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's something. something <laughs> Just check it out. We'll see what happens. Um, it it looks like Charles has been giving me the like signal the to yeah. to wrap it up a little, which is too bad because I feel like we just started talking. But I understand we are on a, a schedule. Do do we have time to play the final response from Jules? Okay. Um, let's do the, that. The, let's do it. Because the, we'll the, the last aria is um, is a continuation of a question that AK asked Jules about this issue of the primacy and secondary status of of sound to the image. So. AK, I like this question of primary or secondary senses and the utopian potential of sound. I assume that this sense of the utopic or potentially transcendent is tied to notions of transcending the body or more specifically, transcending the burdens and limitations of the body as determined through and by a visually dominated social space and the potential burdens of identity. Here we get into some tricky territory because, of course, there is no neutral body and the presumption that there is and that sound can speak to this neutrality feels to me like the ultimate whitewash, specifically the white male hetero wash, which is usually through which this idea is presented. Perhaps I fear more, not that sound doesn't have this power, but that it's being used without a full consciousness of the reverse. Thus, that they are not creating a non-identity space, but rather a space that is most specifically straight white and male. Therefore, I think that sound and the methodology of sound making has to be queer. Queer is the only lens through which I can hold all 
of the very dimensions and implications of sound practice simultaneously. For queer allows and in fact needs both the sublime and the burdened body, the identity and the transcendence, the daily injustice and struggle with the promise of a different future. It needs the maker and the authorless imprint, and we need to have clear ways of holding each with contemplation and listening.